Don Bennett to rawandcookedvegan.com. It's good to have you, and um, let's just get right into it. We talked about some of these things before, but for the benefit of the audience, and, I, and I, you've been doing this so long, I know you've, you've probably gone over this stuff thousands and thousands of times, but there's so many people that still haven't gotten the news. So uh, if, we, if you could, just tell me a little bit about your upbringing, uh, the way your family looked at diet, uh, and um, just your personal inclinations in terms of diet. Well, sure. Um, I grew up in a very standard family in the mid-50s and 60s. You know, it was better living through chemistry, and we had all the preservatives going into the food. So my house was filled with cupcakes and ring dings and ding-dongs and devil dogs and Hawaiian punch and all the garbage that was <laughs> on the market then. So that's what I grew up on. There was a little bit of fruit in the house, which was a nice thing. But it was there, of course, as a snack, so I would get to snack on that every once in a while. Um, dinners were very simple. You know, the age of the frozen food dinners had come out, so it was frozen foods for everything. Um, so it wasn't a very nutritious diet, and it's just amazing that we can, you know, the human body can actually exist and grow on such a, a garbage diet. Right. Um, but I did see people in my family as I grew older. I did see people in my family living to uh, over 100 on one side of my family, and just dying in their sleep of nothing in particular, and people on the other side of my family um, dying at 65 from some horrible illness. The last one sixth or one seventh of their life was the quality of life was not good at all. Okay. So you know you don't have to be a brain surgeon to see that that contrast between the two. So I said, well, I want to be more like you know my grandma and grandpa uh, landsman, so that I could live to over 100, be sharp as a tack up until the very end, and enjoy life and all that. I didn't want to die of some degenerative disease. So that just kept my eyes open for those things that would uh, uh, end up allowing that to happen during the decades that followed. And, and did you, when you kind of went through that in your head, were there practices that the longer-lived relatives of yours were doing that were easily distinguishable from the shorter-lived folks? Well, yeah. Uh, I don't think my grandparents considered themselves uh, vegetarians or any or any kind of label. They just... They were active. They they stayed well hydrated. They didn't they didn't happen to smoke or drink. I don't think it was part of any particular philosophy or religion. They just didn't happen to. Right. Um, and they there was always a lot of fruits and vegetables in their house. So when I would go over there, I'd be able to get all the grapes I'd want. My grandmother always had the green grapes. Now you see, there is a way that they could have improved on that because they could have had the red grapes instead of the green grapes. And, <laughs> um, but there was always plenty of fruit around, and that was a, a good amount, a good portion of their diet. And again, active um, their whole lives. So, and other people in my family were sedentary and eating this, the typical Western diet. So there was a, there was that difference there. Well, it's it's interesting you say that uh, because this often comes up in discussions about diet, and people will often cite, "Well, my grandmother lived to be a hundred, and she smoked a pack of cigarettes every day." You know, and uh, there's always these kind of obscure examples, and everybody has one. I wonder if you could address that a little bit, the misconceptions that arise around that. I mean, if you look at statistics and graphs, it's pretty evident that, you know, traditional dietary practices lead to a problems. So even though there's the, these folks who are the exceptions, most people are going to be subject to probability, right? Well, you know, it depends how you look at it. They're not really exceptions when you think about you know, because I hear the Grandpa Joe stories. My Grandpa Joe smoked uh, a thousand packs of cigarettes a day, and he and he drank. But what they're not telling you is Grandpa Joe had zero stress. Grandpa Joe was the happiest clam on earth. Grandpa Joe was also very active, and Grandpa Joe didn't eat such a bad diet, even though he so he smoked a lot of cigarettes on the one hand. Um, and plus, Grandpa Joe had great genetics. So there's a lot of factors which we don't tend to look at, right. and and those that want to support smoking cigarettes or eating a garbage diet will point to their grandpa Joe's that were doing that and and focus on that and not look for the other reasons that could have accounted for their grandpa Joe living as as long as they did and then what you're also not thinking about yeah grandpa Joe lived to 100 he died at 101 and he had been you know smoking cigarettes but had he not been smoking cigarettes he might have lived closer to what our natural life expectancy should be which is approximately 124 which is the middle of the bell curve but no one's, li no one's living to 124 today. They probably did in prehistory times, in prehistoric times, before there was recordings of it, when there was no ways to really go wrong. And, you, know, you couldn't make any mistakes back then other than maybe wondering, hey, I wonder what's in that cave over there. 
outside, outside of that, there was no way to go wrong. You had to eat the food you were designed to eat because that's all there was. But then we roamed out of paradise, and we were probably then no longer living to an average uh, life expectancy of 124. All right. Now, that, that great points there. Now, I want to go back, though, before I get too far away from it. So you were, you were a youth, and you had these examples within your own family, and you kind of decided for yourself, I want to do what enables me to live the longest and, and the most healthy. And at, like, at what age would you say that you start having, started having these you know, questions about health? Well, I don't know. I, I guess like a lot of people, when I started feeling that there was something not right, for me, it was roller coaster blood sugar levels. I, I had very I had high highs and low lows, and I liked it when it was right in the middle. That's where I was enjoying how I felt when I was in the middle of those roller coaster blood sugar levels. Now I didn't know they were roller coaster blood sugar levels. I didn't know about blood sugar levels or blood sugar metabolism. I just knew that I, I, sometimes I couldn't relax and sometimes I couldn't crawl out of bed. You know, those are the. Right. And, but, but when I was in between those two, I liked that. And what accounted for that? So that made me think about it. Like, what accounts for that? Is there something I'm doing that, that's, that's causing that? So that led me to a book called Sugar Blues by uh, William Duffy. Right. And I said, oh, look at this. But the implication of the book was staggering in that everything that I was eating pretty much was, was a cause of this feeling. So I stopped eating all the, the sugary foods and the junk foods and, and got them, you know, took the ice cream out of my freezer and killed it by putting it in the sink and just letting it go. Uh, and, and no more of that stuff. And I started, at first, I, I got cravings, uh, or it was actually, you know, detoxification and, and rebalancing. I didn't know what was going on. But So at first I felt horrible, but then I felt a lot better. And as the weeks and months passed, I, thought, I started feeling better. So then that led me to wonder, what else on the shelves of the supermarket, because obviously this implicated a lot of stuff on the shelves of the supermarket that's not good for us. So right. what, else, what else on the shelves of the supermarket is not in my best interest health-wise. It started to make me wonder about that. What else am I doing, participating in, consuming that's, that's bad for me? And about what age was this? Oh, boy. I'm terrible with numbers. Always have been. It was probably uh, late teens. It was probably late teens, early 20s. Okay. And would you say up until that point, you were kind of eating everything that was put in front of you without really questioning it? Well, no, I, I thought I was making better decisions. Like if uh, the, my friends were getting pizza, I would say, you know, can you have them do some slices without the cheese, uh, without cheese on it? Because I found that out uh, after the sugar blues, I discovered that dairy products were not in my best interest health wise. So that's when I would do things like that, like say, no cheese on my pizza and right. thinking that the rest of the pizza was a healthy thing to eat now, not realizing how bad grains were, which I wasn't going to know for another, you know, uh, three or four or five years. Um, right. And even before that, you know, just trying to eat the healthier versions of things, the so-called healthier versions of things, whole wheat as opposed to white breads. and uh, right. So I was trying to make better decisions, but I didn't realize how little of an effect going from white bread to whole wheat had versus just getting grains out of your diet. Now, that's interesting. And would you say, so this process began where you started examining, you know, what's on the grocery shelves, what's really healthy for me, and... Did you, did you kind of do that exploration experientially with just eating things and seeing what happened? Or you, you also combine that with study? And I, and I also wanted to ask you at this time, um, you mentioned, uh, you know, William Duffy, the Sugar Blues. Were, were you also becoming aware of some of the, perhaps the natural hygienists at the time or other folks that were talking about diet, that sort of thing? Uh, no, I had no idea of the whole concept of natural hygiene. I had no idea anyone else was writing about that, you know, the, the holistic aspect to health in general. I just got that book by Duffy, and then I said, I wonder, is there a book about meat eating? And I found a, a book uh, by Orville Schell, I think his name is, uh, called Modern Meat. That uh, I mean, I started suspecting certain things were bad for us, and then right. I found a, a book that matched that. It wasn't really the other way around. Uh -huh. um, so the book, that book confirmed that meat was bad. Then I found a book by uh, Dr. Frank Oz that's called Don't Drink Your Milk. And so that confirmed that dairy products were out. So I got all these things out of my diet, and uh, I was still eating some cooked versions of, you know, different um, vegetable dishes. And then soy came in. They started to come out with a lot of soy products after a while as right. substitutes for um, uh, the meat and animal-based stuff. I started doing that thinking that was healthier. 
Um, so it was a very, very long transition, and eventually it got me to the point, uh, long story short, where I just said, you know, what should I be eating? Instead of waiting, you know, finding a book and realizing this is bad, let me look at it from a different tack. What should I be? What am I designed to eat? Once I got right. to that point where I said, what am I designed to blank, that made things a whole lot easier. Now, I should say that I was brought up to be a very independent thinker, a very outside-the-box thinker. That's what right. my mom was, and that's what she instilled upon me. That, so that's the tools I had in my toolbox, logic, common sense, independent thinking. So I started applying that to just food first and then all the other aspects later. But once I did that, I realized, okay, I shouldn't be having to cook anything I eat because that just doesn't make any sense. There's no sense that we are designed to consume cooked foods because we weren't eating them originally. And I don't think the thinking could have been, well, I'm going to design them to eat cooked foods. Let's see if they can get to the point in their history where they can figure out how to do that. We'll start them off on a suboptimal diet. You know, I, Don, this is a huge point, And it's kind of the first thing when I'm talking to someone who eats cooked food. And I, I still eat some cooked food, but... Uh, it's it's amazing to me that this doesn't just jump out glaringly. It's like if you look at every animal in nature, they're eating foods in their raw state. And so th th there's all this processing, cooking, uh, rendering foods that otherwise would not be ingestible, you know, rendering them somewhat fit for eating, but with all these side consequences. It's, it's funny that people don't don't see that and and you did it at such a young age it's a great it's just a great it's wisdom you know well the reason why most people don't do it is because we're unlike some animal species who when they're born the parents don't even have to be there they're they're they they they're born they go they know exactly what to do what predators to watch out for they don't have to be taught or patterned at all we're just the opposite we need to be patterned we need to be taught so when you grow up in a society where things are normal like eating frozen dinners and and, and pet stores are normal and, you know, alcohol is normal when you are of a certain age. You know, these things are the norms, and you just accept them uh, because, you, because you want to be accepted by, your, by everybody else. You want to get along with everybody. And if this, was, if this was on the minds of everybody, this is what needs to be on your mind. You want to be around like-minded people. So, uh, and that's one of the reasons why one, it can be tough to the transition to something that's very different from the mainstream. But there are, there are tricks to dealing with that, too. So... Yeah. That's great, yeah. and I, I, I do want to talk more about that, but I'll let you continue with your story. So you, uh, you did this kind of self-inquiry, this examination of, of foods. You kind of came to the conclusion, hey, it, it makes sense. I should be eating foods in their natural state. And then did you, did you have to do any exploration as to how to work out the best percentages of that? Did you try tons of vegetables, tons of fruit? Did, did, it, did the, did the uh, heavy fruit eating come naturally to you? How did that work out? Well, when I decided that I'm not going to cook anything anymore, and if I have to cook it, it's not for me, then I, once I made that decision, uh, I said, well, what am I going to eat? Oh, yeah. uh, okay, don't get excited now. Don't freak <laughs> out. There's plenty of stuff I can eat. I do love fruit. What, a, what about the radical concept of eating it, not just as a snack, but as an actual meal? Wait, right. and not just as an actual meal, but as an actual diet. Wow, just whoa, what a what a radical notion. But you know, look, the cooked food is always going to be there, so I, I can do an experiment and see what it's going to be like to just eat fruit. Um, and then you know, our closest relatives in nature, what do they eat? I, I love watching PBS specials about uh, the other anthropoid primates. And I saw that they were eating some leafy greens, so I said, all right, well maybe I should be eating some leafy greens too. I didn't really know the whys and wherefores of what we should be eating specifically to take into account our modern agri-based diet yet. I just was going by what I thought we were designed to eat. You know, it's the power, the power of common sense. You just looked at it objectively. I love that. Right. And then, uh, so I started doing this and figuring, well, I'm going to be the only one on the planet doing this. Who else would be nutty enough to do this? And maybe if there are other people who figured it out like I did, because it was just common sense, there might be another... I don't know, 20 or 30 people on the planet doing this maybe. Um, right. I don't know. How would I ever find them? I don't know. And then my friend said to me when he, he found out that I was eating and living this way, he said, oh, you're one of those natural hygienist people. <laughs> I never heard the term before. I said, what is, what is that? Is that like a dental hygienist that doesn't bathe or something? What is that? <laughs> he says, no, they don't eat anything cooked. And, and he started describing 
what I had figured out for myself, that basically what were the tenets of natural hygiene. And I thought he was pulling my leg because he was a great jokester. And I said, oh, come on, you're kidding me. Oh, yeah, they're having a meeting over at Hofstra University in about a week. They have actual, they have conventions and stuff. I'm like, really? I'm going to kill you if you're lying to me. <laughs> um, so I went over and there they were, the American Natural Hygiene Society. And wow. I, was just, I was in tears when I went into a room. There were 90 people in there pretty much living the way that I had discovered to live. I didn't even think about the ramifications of that, that you know, how did that, how should have that made me feel that I figured this out? And these all the other folks, you know, they found out by finding these books. And there were the books on the tables. They're written by Herbert Sheldon and, and T.C. Right. Fry. And I'm like, and you couldn't find those in libraries or bookstores, basically. So I, and there was no Internet at the time. So I don't know how anyone finds out about that kind of information or how they found out about it back then. Do you, um, do you remember who some of the speakers were at that first conference you attended? Oh, sure. There was uh, uh, Alec Burton. He's from Australia. Uh, there was um, uh, Joel Furman, um, who today, Joel Furman has PBS specials. It's great. Yeah. It's wonderful to see him up there. The first 45 minutes of his talk, it could have been me up on that stage. So that's great. Right. Um, and let's see who else. There was uh, DJ Scott. Um, there was, um, oh, the guys out there who run the uh, Tanglewood, uh, not Tanglewood. Um, they're in California now. I, uh, what's his name? Goldhammer, Alan Goldhammer. Oh, yes, yeah. Yep, he was there. Um, so it was a great group of folks to listen to, uh, to find out about this information. And then there were books that I was able to buy, you know, um, uh, hand-printed books or, or self-published books, rather. So it was just wonderful. Now, unfortunately, I got in at the tail end of the original uh, American Natural Hygiene Society. It had changed hands, and now it was getting all... In order to get more members in, they were saying, oh, it's okay to eat some cooked food, and it's not going to hurt you. And I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> so I started becoming aware of the politics, you know, the reality of, of politics of just about anything you get into nowadays, okay, especially now, something... That's very interesting. Does that mean that... Um, what? Because I, I, re I have read, I've read some books by Herbert Shelton, and it seemed like... He was he was saying you know some like maybe dairy products were okay at some times maybe after a fast I don't know if, was he recommending a, a an all raw diet in in regular circumstances? Well, no, he actually wasn't. He I mean a lot of what he recommended I agreed with a hundred percent. But in reading those books, I couldn't find one book that I happened to agree with a hundred percent. Now someone might say, well, Don, who are you to disagree with these? these giants of, of, of natural hygiene and all this, well, who, who am I not to agree? You know, I have a brain just like they did. I'm, they're, they're, they're great and wonderful, but they're nobody special in that sense. You know, you know, you know Don, I'm glad you're saying this because I love uh, what you have, your, your designation, uh, Don Bennett, D-A-S, and uh, um, it's a disease avoidance specialist. Is that it? Is it? Yeah, and I love that because um, we have all these, we have these, innumerable PhDs and lots of folks with PhDs are happily going about killing people <laughs> without any knowledge of nutrition whatsoever so and I think there's this there's this flaw in the the medical system in terms of training and the focus on disease instead of disease prevention so I I love this this uh, way that you qualify yourself DAS but um and, and, and I like that you're just, you're not cowed by other people's degrees or PhDs or whatever. You're just willing to look at things objectively. I, I love it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just my background. I'm more of a researcher than a student. Most people, when they come to something, they go at it as a student. You know, in other words, teach me and I'll just follow whatever it is that you teach me and this is great. I found something that's, that's wonderful. Uh, so they don't question what they're being taught. They may ask questions of clarification of their teachers and mentors, but they're not going to question the basic tenets. I'm a researcher. I question everything. There's no reason why not. I know that we're all just human beings, and there's something called human nature, which allows us to make mistakes. I mean, we make mistakes all over the place. I've made mistakes. So if I can make mistakes, why can't Herbert Shelton and T.C. Fry and some other people make mistakes? Right. So, um, and maybe they corrected that. A good example is uh, Frances Moore LaPay in her first uh, book. Um, oh, what was it? It was uh, Diet for a New Planet or Diet, diet, diet for, for yeah, something like that. Where where she was saying in there that you had to eat all the different protein containing foods, like you had to eat beans and rice together to at get the a same, complete at the same meal in order to get complete proteins. Right. Um, now, if you if you just caught her first book, 
and you study that and follow that, you would continue thinking that, even though she changed that in a sub subsequent printing of the book where she said, I was wrong about that. We, we don't have to do that actually at all. Um, so that's happened a lot where people look at things and they make assumptions. They call them theories, but they make assumptions on things because it's in the absence of being able to, to, to show it scientifically. There was no scientific proof of it, so, but there obviously was a reality concerning proteins. So people just, they assume certain things. You got to eat them all at the same meal. A lot you of things. Say they're, been, yeah, they're still working out theories. Some, some, some yeah. And that's but fine I, to work out a theory as long as you make sure that you let the, your viewing audience or your reading audience know that this is a theory and it may or may not be correct, which is what a theory is. It may or may not be correct. Right. I love that. Um, one thing I, I would like to say uh, uh, in, in the, you know, as, as a thank you to these natural hygienists, I was, I was studying natural hygiene like 20 years ago, and uh, I just, I love these folks for taking a different approach to health and kind of uh, going against the, the, the set mentality of the way disease was being treated. And I, and I think they, they fought uphill battles, even though everything they learned was not true and it wasn't all accurate. They were, I think, far and away, of, you know, doing much more close to health than the conventional medical system was. Well, sure, they were all very well-intentioned. They were well-meaning. They were on the right track. They were working things out. Um, and, and that's great that they, that they did that. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't know, uh, well, I, I would still know some of the things that I know today. I just wouldn't, it wouldn't have been verified for me by, by reading some of this material. Um, right. and of course, meeting other people. Um, uh, there are certain people even in the raw food arena, I won't mention any names, but, you know, they're, <laughs> they get, they have gotten into it because it's now an industry and where you have an industry, you can make a lot of money from it. Yes. So, uh, and they write a book, and it's a very inspirational book. And if that's the, a person's first foray into this whole thing, and they get inspired by it, well, that's great. But you want to be able, to, you want to make that not the only book you follow, because if you just follow that book, you're going to be following a lot of incorrect information. You're going to be getting too much fat in your diet. You're going to be eating chocolate every day because you're told that that's actually a health food for you to do is to eat chocolate every day. Right. Um, so it's good that you do a multi-educational approach, which is one of the things that I recommend, a multi-educational approach, only because there is, I have found no program that's out there that's 100% accurate. So because of that, if you do a multi-educational approach as a researcher instead of a student, you're going to end up getting the correct information eventually because you're going to run into all the conflicting information, which is a good thing. Now, I, I love all everything you're saying. And would you say that you became aware of natural hygiene and you were excited because these folks were reflecting some of the things, you, some of the conclusions you'd reached yourself? And then would you say there was a period where you interact with the natural hygienist community for some time and then began to uh, perhaps question some of the things that were there and, and pursued your own, uh, your own way into, into a more raw, raw food diet? Or were you already there, essentially? Well, no, I mean, I was already there pretty much. I hadn't done any fine tuning of it yet because I didn't think, I didn't realize that there was any fine tuning to be done. I mean, it wouldn't, it didn't surprise me when I did realize it. So being that I was always questioning as I went along, um, especially when I heard something, I don't know, it must, for me, I, I think it's a gift. When I hear, I can hear something and it just doesn't feel right. I can't put my finger on it, but it just doesn't sound right. So that sticks with me and then, and then, when I'm thinking, like, what should I research next? Well, it's going to be one of those things that didn't feel right to me when I heard it. So when I heard the expression that you can get everything you need as far as nutrition is concerned, if you just eat, you don't cook anything that you eat because cooking destroys nutrients. So as long as you don't cook what you eat, as long as you're active enough to warrant eating enough food so that you can get enough nutrition and eat a variety and you'll get everything you need. Well, when I heard that, it just sounded too wonderful. It sounded too simplistic because we're because I acknowledge that we're not living where we used to live. So that may be true, and probably was true, obviously was true, when we lived in our biological eco-niche, when we lived in the Garden of Eden or Paradise or whatever you want to call it. Right. So you can't take paradigms that worked back then and apply them to our modern society because where we get our food from now is very different from where we used to get our food from. Right. Well, I'm glad you went into this a little bit. And I was going to ask you, I, you know a lot about this. I, I've been having some discussions with folks on the Internet, and uh, I don't consider it, for, for me, because I don't have enough information on it to be my strongest argument, but this, uh, our, our physiological origins in terms of 
diet orientation. And uh, I, I get these kind of responses that uh, the primates, uh, that, that if we compare ourselves to chimps or bonobos, they, they evolved in different ecological niches than we did, and then there are some kind of evolutionary changes that have occurred that indicate we're we're meat eating. I find it. I find these arguments ridiculous. I mean, if we if we compare ourselves to a primate, we compare ourselves to a carnivore. I mean, we're much closer to a primate. But then there's also you have all these these varied environments. Humans can survive on many diets. The question is, you know, which diet is the most healthy? So there's a lot of conflicting information in there. But um, would you say that you feel very strongly that we evolved from uh, primates that were that were eating primarily fruit and had very low uh, animal intake, if any, in their diet? Well, to me, it's obvious that we did. It, it, it's just, it, it's plain to see. And then when I start seeing certain things like um, National Geographic, you know, who I admire, and they do a special, a, a very recent one, where they'll show you a chimpanzee, and they'll say, the chimpanzee, our closest relative, and... I'm like, wait a minute, the chimpanzee is not our closest relative, it's the bonobo. How can they be so wrong about this? We've known this for a long time, and this thing was made half a year ago. So I said, okay, so again, human beings can be very wrong about some of the things they say. And I also know that if, you, if you're addicted to something, or you, if it's something you're really passionate about doing, like a meat-eating diet, and that's what right. you want to be able to do, a lot of people, what they will do is they will look for the things that support what it is that they would rather believe. That's a human trait. No other animal can do this. Only us, da 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 da. <laughs> so, and, but it works against us, obviously. If you're supporting, you're looking for supporting information to support something that you believe in that happens to not be true. When you look at the scale of of, of anthropoid primates, and you go up this scale, uh, and there's orangutans, and then there's this and that, and, that, and we're all the way at the top here, and the lower ones are down here. The ones at the bottom here, they're eating more greens than fruit, and there's very little meat eating going on anywhere in there. But let's just talk about greens and fruit. They're eating a lot of greens and very little fruit. As you go up this this incline here and you get to um, bonobos, they're eating a lot more fruit than greens. A lot more fruit than greens. So logic would dictate that if you go even further up, which is us, we would be eating pretty much even more fruit than the bonobos and even, even less greens than the bonobos. Right. So... Uh, so that's one way of looking at it. It's called, uh, you know, from an anthropological point of view. You can do comparative anatomy. You can look at the digestive systems, which dictate what we're supposed to eat. Uh, you can look at the digestive systems of bonobos and look at the digestive systems of humans and then look at the digestive systems of confirmed carnivores and you'll see the differences and the similarities. So that's comparative anatomy. So you can right. look at it from that point too. Then you can look at it from empirical evidence. If some human beings are supposed to eat meat, Let's say it's just based on, I don't know, you can pick something, blood type, um, which was a popular thing. Hopefully it's going away now. But then why do the people who have the blood type that say they should be eating meat, why do they get healthier when they get an animal-based diet, uh, uh, you know, uh, away from an animal-based diet and pick up nice. a, a raw right. plant-based diet? So, right. none, so it doesn't make sense. But, you know, the information is out there. And we give labels to things, the paleo diet, the this diet, the, the you know, it, 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 you know, if you were on another planet where the whole planet was just tropical and there was no, I mean, the whole planet was paradise and human beings were there and they were just eating fruit all over the place and they came down here and looked at what we do, they would just be like, wow, I can't believe, what did, what did they, why did they leave there in the first place? Um, and it's, you know, the, on, on, on your planet, they don't eat, there's no ethnic foods. Everyone's eating basically the same thing. There are restaurants, but they're all serving the same thing, you know. The same, the, the same diet, because every species of animal the planet, it doesn't matter. We all have a species-specific diet, the one diet that we're all designed to eat. But yet, when you look at the diets on this planet of human beings, that human beings eat, they're all radically different. So obviously, there's a lot of people promoting diets who are dead wrong. I'm not even mentioning which diet is the one that's correct. I'm just saying, logically, right. with all these different diets, we all can't be, they all can't be the best for us. Um, and now some people say, well, we're omnivores. Omnivores can eat very different diets. Well, we obviously can eat very different diets and, and survive, but even a true omnivore uh, has a, has a species-specific diet that would, it would rather eat 24-7, 365 if it could. It's just that when he can't, he can still survive on other things. 
a, right. uni a univore that just eats one thing, if that one thing isn't there, that's it. They're dead. They can't eat anything else. And so wouldn't, we, you, yeah, wouldn't you also say that their most preferred diet is the one that generates the most health for that species? Well, yeah, exactly. And the difference being surviving versus thriving. So right. if they can't eat what they would, what they really does best for them, they can eat other things and survive. But if they can eat what they're really designed, their preferred diet, the diet that they're really designed to eat, um, they will they will thrive. And the difference for us between thriving and surviving, it can be the difference between getting and not getting a diagnosis of something serious forty years down the road. Yeah, there's so many things I want to touch on here. You're like spinning on. There's so many things we could address. But one thing I, I think might be worth hearing your knowledge about is let's compare a cooked food to a food from nature. Let's say let's say you take a piece of meat and you cook it or you even cook a grain or even a dairy product and compare the nutritional value to say like a banana. Now in a banana you've got all these nutrients that are in their natural state. They haven't been the only, they've been heated by the sun, you know, and and they're they're all in a in a synergistic uh, uh, combination within that food. Now, when you when you cook these other foods, you know the, the the popular thing now is that cooking renders some nutrients more available. So, I mean, can you put into perspective? I mean, how many nutrients are made available by cooking a piece of steak, and how does that relate to the number of nutrients, phytonutrients that are available in a natural food like a banana? Well, I'll give you a good example. Uh, there was a lot going around about how there was more available lycopene, which is an antioxidant, in a cooked tomato than there was in a raw tomato. As if, as if that was a, in other words, it was being said to support this particular health practitioner's um, advice that, you know, it's fine to eat a, a cooked food diet. Uh, right. you know, and, and, and even better because to eat some cooked foods because some of the nutrients are made more bioavailable. Uh, but what they weren't looking at, and I showed this in a lot of my lectures, is that uh, here's the amount of available lycopene in a, in a cooked tomato, and here's the amount of available lycopene in a raw tomato. See, it's, a, it's less. But here's what we need. Okay, so we only really need this much for optimal health. So what difference does it make if there's slightly more uh, available lycopene in a cooked tomato? And then, you know, I believe in looking at things on balance. And when you take all things into consideration and, and don't look at something in isolation, uh, you, you look at this lycopene issue in a tomato, but what about the other 99 nutrients that are rendered less bioavailable from the cooking process? Amen. Amen. I mean, what happens to vitamin C when you cook it? It's, it's gone, right? So, yeah, it, it seems uh, it's, a, um, it's amazing that people make these comparisons as if these cooked foods are somehow more nutritious. It's, it's, it's a real hard, hard argument to make, I think. You got to look at things on balance, and plus, I can take anything and look at something in isolation. I can make a case for using cocaine and how that and how it's good for you to use cocaine. But that's this one little tiny aspect of cocaine or or alcohol, you know, vodka or something. One tiny little aspect. It's very true that there's a benefit, and here's the benefits. But the detriments far out. Far out. Here's the here's the detriments, and here's the benefits. Right. That's so, like that the, the red red wine, uh, resveratrol or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just a justification for, for drinkers, yeah. A, a radical concept to eat some red grapes, or let's go beyond that. Let's go a little bit more outside the box. Anything with red in it, red bell pepper, watermelon, strawberries, it's got, it's got plenty of um, resveratrol. So. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a, huge, a huge kind of insane debate going on there. But um, So anyway... Uh, would you say that after this kind of introspection and, well, I guess it's, it's just been this ongoing process, and as, you, as you've cruised along, you've picked up things along the way, and I, and I sense, too, that you've maintained this questioning attitude within the raw food community itself, and I think uh, that has resulted in your objectivity regarding supplementation. So I, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about that. Well, sure. When I, when I realized that where the foods... Are, you know, that we're eating now are coming from, and how, and again, how are we, how are the foods that we were designed to eat, how are they designed to be eaten? Let's put it that, it's not enough just to look at what we're designed to eat, but how are we designed to eat it? So, in other words, the, the transit time of an apple 
even though an apple is not really a tropical fruit, but apples are very popular. So the transit time of an apple from when it's picked to when we eat it is two seconds That in nature. There's right. the apple, it, boom, and you eat it. Right. Now, the transit time for apples that everyone's eating today who aren't picking their own could be weeks or even months. So I'm like, aha, uh -huh. I wonder what happens to the nutritional value of the apple because there's no way the designer of an apple is could have ever designed the apple with the intention that, hey, I've got to make the nutrients last in this apple for months because one day I think they're going to have a society <laughs> where there's going to be all this. No, it's, just, it's designed to be eaten instantly, basically. Uh, plus, it's designed to also stay on the tree long enough. I mean, I see animals going around to a tree with fruit on it, and they're looking at different ones, and they're not just picking the first one they come to. They're very selective. Now, what are they doing? Are they doing it by sight, by smell? I don't know, but they're, you know, when you, when you realize that not every orange or every apple or, or, or every um, uh, whatever's growing on the tree ripens at the exact same moment, they're trying to look for the, the ripest one because the ripest one is going to be the one with the most nutrition in it. Right. So if you, if you pick it prematurely, like, like the agri-based food system has to do in order for it to get to our counters without rotting, uh, once, it's, once that apple or whatever, orange or whatever it is is disconnected from the tree or the bush or the vine, that's it. There's no more nutrition going to go into it. So they're all right. being pricked, uh, picked prematurely because of, you know, early harvesting dictates that. So they're not going to be as nutritious as they could have been. And then you, um, you square that with the fact that the soil they're being grown in is, there's a, a lot of stuff is being grown on a small amount of soil because it's now an industry and they, and they have to do this. And the farmers are not growing for nutrition. They're growing for yield. They're growing for size. They're growing for shelf life. Right. Just about everything other than nutrition because no one's forcing them or even asking. There's no market for super nutritious food or super nutritious apples. You, you go in, you're not going to see any signs that say, you know, the super nutritious, this is a super nutritious version of an apple. Pick now we, today. Pick today, right? Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, even, even pick today, you know, even vine ripened, what about the soil? Um, so there's just no market for it because there's no demand for it, um, which is unfortunate. So once I realized, the, you know, I believe in, de in dealing with reality, and, and, you know, because that's where we all are living. And I know too many people who are living in a fantasy world. And, uh, you know, they're living in a fantasy world, but their body is still in reality. And still, right. you know, it still has to, is governed by the, the laws of physics and biochemistry and all this other stuff, and, and just by reality. So if the foods that we're eating are not as nutritious as they're designed to be, I had to wonder... Am I getting all the nutrition that, I'm, that my body requires? Because I don't think for an instant that my body is just going to say, hey, you know, I'm not getting the nutrients that I require on a regular basis. So, oh, well, I'll just, you know, I'll reinvent myself and I'll adapt to needing less nutrients. No, the body needs what it needs. Right. Uh, and like, for instance, you know, we used to have, we used to live in, in an area where we can get plenty of vitamin D. When we then moved to areas where the sun wasn't strong enough during certain times of the year, we weren't getting enough vitamin D. The body adapted as best it could by lightening the skin to let it, you know, let more UV light through to make more vitamin D. But even it has a limit to its adaptation on that because it, we're still not getting enough vitamin D in a lot of instances. This so really I had, a, yeah. Yeah, I, had a, I, was, I had to wonder about the nutritional aspect. So once I started doing it, I said, you know, how can I, how can I research this? I mean, do you, can you go by the charts that say what's, you know, here's what's in uh, 100 grams of romaine lettuce. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. I know that that's not true because that's what's supposed to be. But the research is showing that that's not what actually is. So once I started seeing this, I said, all right, they don't even know what they're talking about now. And then the RDIs, you know, the recommended daily intakes for certain things, how do they arrive at that? Once I started realizing that a lot of those are, are arrived at politically or for expediency of profit, I'm like, okay, I can't go by any of this. So again, go back to my toolbox, logic and common sense. How can I make certain assumptions like, well, sure, that I'm not getting enough of certain nutrients from the foods I'm eating. I have no idea which ones, but what can I do about that? Um, well, that's what nutritional supplementation is for. So let me go find a worthwhile nutritional supplement that will give me that. That's because because supplements are the natural ones. Let's say you're taking a, one of those green powder ones. Let's say it's a good one. It's being produced uh, for nutritional purposes. It's a nutritional supplement, unlike the greens that are being grown for you to throw into your salad. They're grown for everything except nutrition. So yeah, here's the opposite point. end of the spectrum, something that's being made specifically as a nutritional adjunct to your diet. Right. So now, Having said that, though, there are 
lots of nutritional supplements that are ma manufactured simply to make money. Oh, and, sure. And uh, the quality is highly questionable, right? Uh, the, it's high. Ninety-nine percent of the supplements that are sold out there are worthless. Okay. It's yeah. just it, it, it's the wild, wild west out there when it comes to supplements because the regulations are not like they are for the pharmaceutical industry. When you buy a pharmaceutical and it says it has a hundred um, milligrams of acetaminophen in it in Tylenol, you, you can take that to the bank. You know it's in there, and you know, and it says what the shelf life is of it and everything. But if you buy a, a B12 supplement that it says it's got a thousand micrograms of uh, you know, B12 in it, it may not. And that's a, and that's, a, that's a shame. You know, while we're here, I, I want to ask you, now I know, I, I think I have a good idea of your position on this, which is uh, you've identified some of the nutrients that are not supplied by foods that are currently available, and therefore you supplement for those, but your contention is that uh, there are probably many we don't know about. And so some of your supplements... Uh, take that into account. And, but I wonder, as far as the nutrients we know that might be lacking in a, uh, a, raw, a primarily raw food diet, can, could you list those that are essential? Well, they're all essential. Okay, right, right. <laughs> in that they have to, with the exception technically of B12, because we're supposed to be able to make the B12 ourselves, but there's so many reasons why we don't. I just, I just published an article on B12. It's one of my in-depth articles that hopefully will explain the whole thing so that it puts an end to the debate. But um, you know, it <laughs> yeah, will never put yeah. an end. The debate will always go on. But it, let's put it that way. It explains what it, – hopefully it will solve all the confusion that it's out there. But with the exception of B12, which is not even a vitamin technically, and, and, and forgetting about D because these are two things that are not really supposed to come from diet. If you're talking about the, the nutrients that are supposed to come from the foods we eat, um, they're all essential because our bodies are not making them. It, ha it has to come from the foods we eat. So right away – this kills the whole concept of breatharianism. We have to eat food. Okay, we got to eat food. Um, our bodies are not going to be making this stuff or pulling it out of the air. Right. Now, wh which ones are we not getting? The ones that I found that I, I call the problematic nutrients, okay. um, the ones that are causing the most problems, and, and this has been verified by uh, a lot of research that's out there. In fact, there was just one excellent research study that showed that you know, vegans who you'd think would have a, um, a health potential over people eating an animal-based diet and, and a standard Western-based diet. Right. According to the research, no, they're not really doing any better, and in some aspects, they're doing worse. So when I saw that, by this time, I know why. But if I had seen that research years ago, I would have like, well, how can that possibly be? I now know how can that be. It's, it, there are certain nutrients that we're not getting. We, um, there are a number of nutrients that, once we started eating from an agro-based system, we started coming up with deficiency diseases, beriberi, scurvy, rickets, um, goiter. And then once we figured out what was causing that, a lack of a certain nutrient, the government's just mandated that those nutrients be added to food, the food supply for the public. Right. So those, those are the obvious ones. Uh, so when you stop eating fortified foods, which are generally foods that are otherwise are not good for you, when you start eating just natural foods, well, there goes the fortification process. So now you're on your own. Now you got to make sure that you're still getting those things that still may not be in the foods you're getting. So if you're growing your own foods, that's one thing, and that's great. Now you don't really have to worry because you can take really good care of your soil and pick when it's exactly ripe and the transit time is two seconds. But if you're eating from an agri-based system, there's problems. Uh, D and B12 are two of them, but again, they're not even supposed to be coming from food, but because they were fortified and now they're not, we can bump, bump up against problems. One of the biggest uh, food provided nutrients that I've found that's the most problematic is iodine. And, you know, not many people are talking about it, although it was talked about a lot about a hundred years ago. I mean, <laughs> a lot. That's the way we're talking about B12 now, well, actually, not even because the mainstream public doesn't talk about B12. But a hundred years ago, iodine was on the lips of everybody in the mainstream. Yeah. Because th there were noticeable signs of an iodine deficiency called goiter, which is a swelling of the thyroid gland, and some babies being born with, with um, lower IQs, and, they, and you could tell by looking at them. Hence, like, I iodized salt, right? Well, and then and the government, once they discovered what was going on, finally said, okay, we got to get iodine, since it's not in the foods, and we need it, and it's supposed to come from food, um, let's just iodize salt with it, because everybody was using salt. So that solved the worst case scenario of goiter and, and what's called cretinism. But it was only enough that was put in the soil to just solve the worst case scenario. 
<laughs> this isn't a black and white on or off issue. The, the thyroid still needs iodine to do a lot of other things. Uh, control your metabolism properly. It's part of your immune system, bones, eyeball, brain. There's an area in the brain. Uh, all these places, in the breast tissue concentrates iodine. If you're not getting enough of it, okay, so it's great you don't have a severe, in, uh, a severe deficiency, but now you've got an insufficiency. So your, your, your immune system is working insufficiently. Now, who wants an immune system that's working insufficiently? Oh, I, I, don't I, love, that. System. I love that clarification. Right, um, so this has been one of the problematic nutrients, and 99 out of 100 times when, I, when someone comes to counsel with me, and they're my client, and I say, okay, before you even tell me what's going on, let's just test for D, B12, and iodine, see where you are, and correct them if there's something wrong. And most of the time, they're low on D, they're low on B12, and they're low on iodine. I don't really find, unless they're already supplementing with these things, they're going to be low to some degree. Uh, and sometimes there'll be symptoms that, you know, corroborate this and, and coordinate with it, um, uh, but sometimes they're not. But just because you're not manifesting a symptom, like my dad, you know, he was feeling fine until he got a diagnosis of cancer, and the, and the tumor was as big as my fist. Wow. But, but prior to that, you know, it takes about 30 to 40 years to get to be that big. So I said, Dad, five years ago, how are you feeling? He said, I felt fine. He didn't know anything was wrong, yet yeah. he had a tumor, a tumor in him slightly smaller than my fist. So you can feel, quote, unquote, fine, but you don't know really how fine you can feel. And a good example of that is when I started researching iodine intensely, I said, well, as part of my research, I've got to test myself. So let me test myself, see where I am. Now, I knew years ago that iodine is important, just like they all are, and where am I going to get my iodine from? I better eat some sea veggies just to make sure as a hedge against an iodine you know, insufficiency, I'll do that. And stay away from chlorinated water and fluorinated things and bromine things, you know, the things that are like anti-iodine. So I figured I was good. Now, it's not good to assume that, so I said, well, let me now test myself. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 100, where 1, you'd be dead because you don't have enough iodine, and 100, you're, the tank is full, yeah. where, do you th where do you think I was? And you were eating sea vegetables? I'm going to guess uh, 50, 50? Well, yeah, I was 47. Okay. Now, for, that's not good. I should be 90 to 100. That's, okay. that's when you pretty much can be sure that your immune system is working properly and everything's working well. So wow. at 47, I'm guaranteed that things aren't working well. So I'm like, well, look at that. You know, even though I don't have the toxicity of, of the hal halogens and halides in me, I'm still not getting enough. I'm just not getting enough iodine. That was the only thing. Then I discovered why. When you dry sea vegetables, a lot of the iodine evaporates out. So now they're not going to, you'd have to eat a lot more of them than I was eating. And it, it's not a reliable source for iodine. So, What's the reliable source for iodine today? A supplement. And that's unfortunate, and people bristle at the notion of that. But what are you going to do? Either move someplace where you can eat stuff that's grown closer to the ocean, where the iodine can evaporate and turn into a gas out of the ocean and, and permeate the soils there. Or if you're eating foods, I mean, all of California, the soils, it, it's the goiter belt. The soils are iodine deficient. So all the foods coming from California are iodine deficient. You're not getting your iodine from there. But the bottom line to that is when I started doing iodine therapy to bring my iodine levels back up, I just wanted to bring my iodine levels up to where they're supposed to be. Uh, so after I tested, I figured I'd do some therapy for 90 days, retest again, and see where I am. I never expected I would feel any better because after 20 years of eating an all-raw fruit-based diet, I figured I was feeling as best as I ever could feel. I'm also, by the way, paying attention to all the other equally important aspects of robust health, exercise, sunshine, sleep, and all this other stuff. But when I started taking the therapeutic amounts of iodine, I felt better. Wow. That's I interesting. Felt, I felt noticeably better physically. I'm like, wow, I feel just, I feel better. But what? then it stands to reason because now all the systems that depend on iodine that weren't getting enough, that were getting marginal amounts, now they're operating at, at peak efficiency now that I'm getting goodly amounts of iodine in me. That's really so, you know, when you think you can't feel any better, you still probably can. <laughs> What, just real quickly, um, when you have a client come to you who is severely iodine deficient, what are some of the symptoms that arise from that? Um, fatigue is a, is a big one. Uh, now, do we know anybody out there in, in the general population who deals with you know, premature fatigue <laughs> at the end of the day? Of course, most people, they, they fall asleep in the middle of their dinner. You know, their head goes right into the mashed potatoes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but there enough, could be lots of reasons besides iodine for that. I mean, but well, well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. You know, the symptom of fatigue can be caused by a lot of things. But 
uh, it could be D, B12, but if somebody is, if, if you just work on their iodine, you know, if their D and B12 was good, because I, I get some clients who have been following me for years, and they've been following my information that I give out free on the website and how to deal with D and, and B12, and they've done it, they've self-assessed, self-corrected, they, they, they felt better, but now they come to me because they just want something else checked out. We check out the iodine. I mean, I test them for everything, but, but they're okay on D and B12. Now we check them out for iodine, and they're low. They're like 30 or 40. We, we correct that. They feel a lot better. They have more energy. They don't fatigue as quickly. Uh -huh. So in that case, there's fatigue that was caused by iodine. So you can have a symptom that's caused by multiple things. Uh, so in other words, there's usually contributing factors to any particular symptom. Other things with iodine, uh, your thyroid is the biggest consumer of iodine in your body, the thyroid gland. Uh, and your thyroid controls your metabolism. It's the master controller of your metabolism. It makes most of your hormones. So if your, if your thyroid isn't working properly for lack of enough iodine, anything that relies on hormones is not going to be working properly. So uh -huh. it, affects, it affects women more than men, uh, yeah. but, but it will affect metabolism, your basal metabolism. So if yeah. you're having trouble losing the last 15 or 20 pounds, let's say, because I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat now, I'm being active, but I don't know what it is. I just can't get rid of these last 15 or 20 pounds. You probably got low iodine. You get that back up to where it's supposed to be. Your metabolism rises to where it's supposed to be. It operates properly. Now you can get to your ideal weight where you couldn't before. So that's another symptom. There's a lot of other ones. I just am finishing up an in-depth article on iodine. It's it, and it's a long one. I didn't mean it to be, but it it is out of necessity because there's just so much to know about it, and it's wow. so it, it affects us in so many ways. You know, I want to say it's kind of mind blowing, but Actually, when I think about it, it's not for me. It's not. It just it stands to reason. That's right. why I'm thinking. Hey, it all stands to reason. Now, if if somebody else would read it, somebody in the raw food community who never gave iodine a thought, and they read this, I'm going to be blowing a lot of minds out there when they read this article. That's great. That's real. That's interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you. Uh, I can't. I've only got eight minutes. <laughs> but uh, um, when you do your studies, uh, I'm sure now you use primarily the internet. Did you? Uh, what, what did you do prior to the to, to the internet coming on strong? Would you go to libraries and, and pull out stuff, or you just no? There's bang? nothing. There's nothing in libraries <laughs> that's helpful. And I've even tried to buy books by T. C. Fry or, or raw food books. Even when I wrote my books, I tried to donate them to libraries. Right. And they have to go by a committee before they're put on the shelves. I went and looked. They're never put on the shelves. They're just, it's too radical a notion, too extreme, or whatever. To, to make it onto the shelves of libraries. So there, you're not going to be able to find truly health-enhancing information in a library. A bookstore is a different story. Uh, obviously, the Internet makes that really easy because you can just go to a specific website. Like if you go to my website and you look on recommended reading, you'll probably see not a lot of books because, I mean, the books that I've bought over the last 35 years, it's, it would fill, fill, fill many bookshelves. <laughs> I've spent th thousands and thousands of dollars on books. You only need about maybe four, five, eight, two. <laughs> you know, you don't need a whole bookshelf of stuff to get, you know, the, the bottom line of what you need to be optimally healthy. Right, right. Um, one thing I really wanted, uh, there's two, two more things I want to ask you if we have time. Uh, one is, uh, how did you address this issue of, of taking on such a different diet over the years in relation to family and society? And, uh, it, it, you're obviously, you know, a, a strong-willed, independent person, and, and uh, I think there's a lot of people like that in the raw food and, and the vegan community. But uh, I just, I'm just curious to hear, how did you cope with it psychologically? Do you still interact with your family? Do you go to Thanksgiving? Do you, uh, do you, uh, are you quiet about your beliefs? Or if someone shows interest, you, I'm sure you share knowledge with them. Is it? Is it frustrating to see people dying when you know they don't have to? All those things. Well, sure, of course. I mean, in the beginning when I started finding out things that I knew could benefit other people, I would grab them by the collars and shake them to tell them. And like, <laughs> you, you have to do this. You have to look at this. You know, read this book here. Bing, bing, hit them over the head with it. Because, right. I, because I knew. But then again, I, started, I began to realize that it, it can only be helpful to them if they would embrace it, if they would consider it. And I can't make people consider anything. That comes from within. You have to consider something for yourself. You have to want to look into it for yourself. So I've gotten pretty good over the years at lighting 
at, at lighting fires under people, you know, in people's minds about things and getting them to question things, getting them to ask me questions. Like if they say to me, where do you get your protein from? I say, I don't know, you tell me. I, I only eat fruit, so where do I get my protein from? <laughs> so, I, so I make them kind of answer their own questions or ask other questions. Um, family, it's, it's a tough one. Uh, some people will have family that will get right along with them, and, and you know, but other people will have family that don't want to even hear it. Um, I, I have friends and family who think, who've known me forever, you know, obviously family has, and how could I, how could, how could Don know these things? You know, people go to school <laughs> for this stuff for, you know, a long time, and he doesn't have any degrees, he didn't even finish college. How could he know this stuff? What's the and, line of, a prophet is never respected in his own town, you know? <laughs> well, they, exactly, exactly. So, you know, I ha I can influence the people that uh, are open to it. They're, they are, you know, they can see the light. Uh, other people have to feel the heat before they get into it. But the people who have wisdom, and it really comes down to valuing what, what do you value most. You know, you, you, everybody has an internal list of what they value, what's most important to them in life. And if your health is number one on the list, you'll want to listen to somebody like you or me. But if your health is number two, well, if, even if it's just number two, if there's something that comes before it, like let's say self-indulgent pleasure-seeking behavior, <laughs> if that's not <laughs> fun, you're not going to want to hear anything about how haagen ice cream is not good for you or, or if, you're, if you're addicted to anything, if you're addicted to drinking or smoking pot or running or whatever you're addicted to, you're not going to want to hear anything negative about that. You only want to focus on the positive things. Um, so, you know, I... I I feel people out to see what they could be interested in. If they value their health, I'll share certain things with them. And I'll just say here, read this book. Other, other folks who aren't necessarily healthcare practitioners um, might say, you know, if they get a book uh, by somebody like myself, they'll say, and they want to influence their spouse or their friend, they might say, hey, I read this book. It's, it's really pretty interesting, but I'd be interested to know what you think of it because I really value your opinion. Would you read it and let me know what you think? Well, people love to have their their, you know, their uh, opinions that's valued. So that's a way to kind of trick them into reading the book. Um, <laughs> other other things I tell uh, certain people like women, you know, it, it, thank you for loving my book. If you want your husband to get into it, just leave it on the table. Leave it out. He'll read it when you're not around. And he'll put it back exactly where it was so it won't look like he even read it. Um, but that's the best thing you do. Just leave it out there. Um, or, or just tell your husband, you know, oh, well, nah, I'm not, you wouldn't do this. And just take, take the book and, and walk away with it. And he'll say, what, what do you mean I wouldn't do it? I'll do it. What is it? Give me, give me that thing. <laughs> so there's all kinds of little tricks you can play with people. I don't like playing mind games, but if it gets them to embrace something that you know is going to be helpful for them and that you know they're going to thank you decades down the road for having them do this, for introducing them to this, then, you know, you do what you have to do. But, uh, look, I know there's a lot of people who are not going to listen. They, they're, you know, look, there, there are people who get a diagnosis of, uh, lung cancer, and they get a lung removed, and the doctor tells them, listen, you know, Joe, you have to stop smoking. We can't remove the other lung, so you have to stop smoking. Yeah, 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 doc, I'll stop, and they don't stop. Right. So I, 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 I've kind of figured out that the people who will listen to folks like you and me are the people who really are enjoying the party. Have you ever been to a party that you really enjoy? You hope it never ends, and you'll do anything to stay at this party, but there are some other people out there who they can't wait for the party to end. They're not really enjoying themselves. It's not so bad that they're going to leave the party prematurely, you know, by committing suicide, but they just can't wait till it's over because they're just not enjoying themselves. Now, the, the sad part about it is they could be enjoying the party a lot more if they were just in better health. Right, right. Uh, that's a great point. Um, I know you have to go. I, if you can fit it in, I want to ask you one more question. Um, sure. Personally, I'm kind of looking at the, the variety of diets that are available on a kind of scale. And I realize that for you, it's clear through your personal experience and through your studies that a raw food diet is the healthiest possible diet for, you know, homo sapiens. Uh, having said that, uh, I want to kind of bridge a gap between uh, raw food vegans and cooked food vegans. and. Uh, to me, the, the cooked food vegan diet is, is exponentially better than the other possible diets. Uh, however, if you compare it to the raw food diet, it appears that the raw food diet is, is, is a higher value diet than the, than the cooked vegan. So I just would like to hear your thoughts on that. I know that grains are 
really taking a hard hit lately with all this gluten intolerance and uh, that sort of thing. And, and grains can make up a big part of a cooked vegan diet. Um, I don't know how many people actually have celiac disease. I think those numbers are kind of exaggerated. But what, what are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, it, what kind of a diet that you are you're willing to embrace really depends on how healthy do you want to be. So instead of looking at it like, well, what diet, let me look at the diets that are available to me and which one do I like, I recommend a different approach. Just first to think about, you know, how valuable health is to you. Think about how every day that I'm alive, I'm going to have a level of health. What do I want that level of health to be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years from now? I'm going to have to make investments in my future health today. So how, how healthy do I want to be then? And that, so that, you know, okay, so I really want to be as healthy as I, as my DNA will allow me to be. So maybe I better eat the healthiest diet. And the healthiest diet is not going to uh, in, include grains or cooked food. But maybe you're not ready to be there yet. So make your decisions of what, what your end result is, you know, your end game, where your, your goal, where you want to be. Right. And then just try and get there as soon as is comfortable for you to do it. You know, everyone has their own pace. Some people go there overnight because they see the light. Uh, some people need to transition over a one or two or three year period. But the point is don't fool yourself along the way. Don't fool yourself into believing that what you'd rather eat is, is just fine health wise and you'll be okay with it. Um, we have some certain raw food is today we've been eating a raw food diet, you know, 100% all raw food diet. But I think they've come to the realization that to become even more popular, because obviously <laughs> advocating a 100% raw fruit based diet is going to attract the micro, 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 micro minority. So to, to get a larger audience saying that, well, some cooked food is okay, even on a regular basis for the rest of your life, that's being a little irresponsible in my opinion. It's fine. I tell people that while you're transitioning, oh, yeah, some cooked food is, is fine, especially in the winter, in areas where it gets cold, some steamed sweet potatoes. You know, there are things you can do and, and still consume. Um, but some things I recommend, like, you mentioned celiac disease, you know, just because you don't have the symptoms of it doesn't mean that gluten isn't affecting you negatively. Right. And I think that's, that's a point that a lot of people, you know, because I had people tell me, oh, no, I can, I can eat gluten-containing products because I don't manifest any symptoms of, celi uh, you know, of, a, of a problem that you know of. Right. Your, body may, your body may still be being hampered by certain uh, problems dealing with the gluten, but then there's the other aspects of it. The fiber is not the kind of fiber we need. The fiber from grain products scratch us and cause our intestines to try and protect itself with all kinds of protective mechanisms. So, you know, you try and get out of your diet the things that are most harmful to the body. Uh, dairy products for various reasons, but some people say, no, I'm just going to raw dairy products because, you know, cooked is bad, but raw is good. And in this article on iodine, by the way, I explain how raw dairy and raw eggs can actually be a form of a supplement. It's not that we actually need it because some people do these things and they feel better when they incorporate them back into their diet and they feel better and they don't understand why. They just assume that, well, I guess we're, we're designed to require eggs and, and milk. They're not using logic and common sense because they're not taught to, but what they are doing is using uh, raw milk and raw eggs as a supplement. And, and it's funny because some of these people are against supplements. And when you let them know that you're, you're actually supplementing iodine and some other things by using these products, they're like, oh, man, so I can go back and being a vegan, but I need to take a supplement, but I don't, you know. Uh, so there's a lot that's to know brilliant. about. That's brilliant. That's a brilliant point, yeah. Uh, so as far as the different diets that are out there, vegan, if, you're, if you want to be vegan, if you don't want to have any animal products, there's certain things you still need to be, there's certain things you need to be aware of, whether you're vegan or or, um, or, or not or anything. No matter what diet you're eating, raw diet, vegan diet, mainstream diet, it doesn't matter. You still need a certain amount of nutrition, uh, you still, and you've got to be able to get it. E even if people eating the, the, the mainstream diet would incorporate into their uh, typical Western diet some D, B12, uh, a good, like one of the good green powders that'll give them some nutrition, and they cut down on uh, some of the more hazardous things to their health, like the grain products and, um, and the dairy products, it just, just bring them down to a lower level and get more, you know, steamed sweet potatoes into them, more salads and more fruit and vegetables, they would do a lot better. Um, do, you think, so, um, do you think that if the proper nutrients are being supplied by the diet, either supplementally or through the food, would you say that a cooked vegan diet 
is better than an animal product based diet? Well, sure. Oh, of course. There's no, there's no question about that. Okay. But again, it's just a matter of degrees because it's better uh, in some respects, but they're still better. If you can get the grain products out of your vegan diet, if you can be vegan without grain products and very little soy products, that's even better. If you can right. be you know, cook, cook vegan, I should say. If you can be cooked vegan without the grain products and the soy products, that's even better. So you can still be eating cooked food, but it's, it's cooked vegetables and stuff that you can still make. Gotcha. And if you can stop cooking that, and, and all the while, you know, you're taking a nutritional supplement, that's still a lot better. But I've always been, I've always been big on the best. You know, when I bought a stereo system for my car, <laughs> I wanted the best stereo system because I listened to classical music and I wanted to respect Everybody in that orchestra and respect the conductor and respect the composer, whether it's Mozart or Beethoven, they all went through a lot to make that beautiful music so that I can listen to it. So I want a, a, the best stereo system in there so I can hear this music as if I'm in the concert hall. So why shouldn't I apply the same line of thinking to my diet and my other lifestyle practices? It just right. makes good sense. I want the best health. I want to feel the best. I mean, we do certain things like coffee and smoke pot and drink because we want to feel really good. So I want to feel as good as I can on the natural diet and lifestyle practices that I'm designed to have uh, so I don't need any of the recreational things that have their downsides to them. Yes, that's beautiful. Let me let you say, if you will, Don, the, the name of your website. Okay, it's uh, health101.org. Okay. And if you go there, you, you'll find the two books that I've written. I'm working on a third book. That's the first one, Avoiding Degenerative Disease. Excellent. This is a good, good one for raw food. It's, it's the Q&A book. Um, it's actually written by you guys. It's written by it's 200 questions from people like your viewers, the great questions that I went and answered and put into book form. Um, That's beautiful, beautiful. And, I, and I, am I right in thinking you're working on another book? Or, or that is the Q&A yeah, book? Yeah, I'm working, I'm working on a book that I never thought I would ever write. It's a diet book. <laughs> and you know why I, I'm doing it because people clients over the years when they come to me they said I've been doing the paleo diet for a few years now I've been doing the 80-10-10 diet for a few years now I've been doing the blah 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 they all have a label of the diet that they've been doing for a few years and then they say you know and I, and I think I'm going downhill or something's not right or I got some kind of symptom but the point is they, they name a diet they name something they don't describe it to me they just name it, and I immediately know what it is, obviously. So I'm like, okay, I can spend the rest of my life describing what we should be eating, but I guess I've got to give it a name. Now, I've tried doing things like, you know, um, fruit-based diet plus. I've added the plus sign next to raw vegan fruit-based diet. I put a little plus in there to try okay. and signify that there's something else. So that gets a conversation started. Oh, what's the plus about it? I've seen raw vegan fruit-based diet. What's the plus? Yeah. Well, oh, the plus is, you know... I'm fond of saying food matters, but nutrition matters more. That's another yeah, way of looking at it. Food like matters, that. but nutrition matters more. We really, if we don't have the proper nutrition, if we can get all the nutrition we needed from a mango, we wouldn't really need to eat anything else. We need to eat variety because not all foods have the same um, makeup of, of nutrients in them, or they're supposed to anyway. Um, and then, there, of course, the plus also stands for getting enough sunshine and sleep and the non-food provided nutrients like B12 and D and all that. So the book I'm writing is called uh, The the Foodtrition Diet. All right. I like that. I like the that. The Foodtrition Diet. You go to foodtritiondiet.com. I've got that now. So I'm like, oh, my God. I can't believe I have to write this book. But, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest with you, Paul. When I first started doing this and, going, and, and opening up a private practice and, and lecturing and teaching, I knew I was going to have to be dealing with the misinformation from the, the, the meat industry, the dairy industry, the medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry. I knew that going in, and, and that's why one of the reasons I'm doing this. I never thought I'd really have to be having debates with, with people in the raw food arena, but uh, human, human nature being what it is, yeah. I found I've had to do that, even at, a, at an event where there's like, you know, a dozen of us there, and we're all on the same page. It's for, it's for raw fruit eaters from around the world to come, the Woodstock Fruit Festival. Um, by the way, and you've heard of that Woodstock Fruit Festival? I have, I have. I saw your invitation to it, and uh, I, I may try to go next year. It, it, uh, it looked amazing. It, it's kind of expensive, but it looks really amazing. Well, if you, I mean, if you're going to look at it as a vacation, it's the best vacation you could take. Yeah. Uh, 
I did write an article about it. It's on my website in the article section, the Woodstock Food Festival. Um, but even there, you know, you have a dozen or 15 or 16 of the, the premier pioneer raw food uh, educators from around the world to come there to teach. You know, I, I was hoping when I heard about this, this was great, we'll all be on the same page. But then I realized we're not really all, we're close. We're so close. But sometimes that difference can mean the difference between thriving and surviving. Well, you know, you know, Don, it's interesting. I actually think it's kind of a good thing. You know, I, there's an analogy that another vegan made uh, with uh, the civil rights movement. Uh, you know, you had Martin Luther King and you had Malcolm X, and, you, and both together uh, helped bring, bring these changes about. You know, so I think it's actually maybe a healthy sign that there's this diversification within the movement and it's just going to broaden. It's going to broaden, and I think it'll it'll allow more to enter through different avenues. You know, it's good as long as you remember that it's good to do multi-educational research. You know, listen to different programs, and you'll fi and you'll find things that are the same. Now, if you listen to like five different programs, and there's something that's common to all of them, well, that's probably correct. Yes. But, but with the stuff that you find that you know. What what is it? The devil is in the details. When you find the things that don't uh, jive with each other, there's your research. Now you got to f find out why. Why are the you know why is this? There are two basic differences here: supplements or no supplements, or or lots of exercise or a more appropriate amount of exercise. You know why, why are the? And then once you start, to, then it's of course what you're going to resonate with. If you have a philosophy against doing supplements. Well, that's one thing, but that's that might go against what your body wants. Your body has right. no philosophy. Your body just has needs. So if you want to do a lot of activity, um, it may be more than a, an appropriate amount for the body, but maybe you want to do it more of an appropriate amount. I've had people tell me recently, accuse me of being underactive. Now, you might say it's more of a relative thing, but I think I'm very appropriately active. I can climb up and down a tree like it's nothing. And as far as I'm concerned, that's the criteria for am I in good shape. If I can climb up <laughs> down the tree, no problem. I can't run a marathon, but, you know, I don't think we're designed to be able to run marathons. or that's, that, that, that's something that would have been a survival tactic. A survival tactic would have been just sprinting real quick away from a lion. Right. Now, you might say, there's no way you can outrun a lion, but you know what? You don't have to outrun a lion. You just have to outrun the person you're running with. <laughs> you know, I, I love the point you're making. I do respect a lot of vegans who are showing through these extreme athletics that the, the vegan diet is completely uh, capable of, of turning people into powerful athletes that can compete and exceed beyond conventional diet, you know, uh, approaches. But I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, and I think one has to be careful. You know, I had an interesting interview with uh, Dr. Ruth Heidrich, who, who does triathlons, and she runs barefoot. And uh, her contention is that the, the running has stimulates osteoblasts, and she says her knees are great, and uh, she thinks it's been good for her joints. But I, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, it, you have to wonder, in our natural environment, would we, would we be inclined to, to do that kind of intense exercise? I, I hear you. But how do you think the conversation would go if you ask Ruth, well, Ruth, what about your internal organs? They're, they're held in place by ligaments, and with every bounce of, of running, the ligaments are, are, stre are stressed. Now, if you ran just very occasionally, you know, to sprint or something, no big deal. But if you're running constantly like that, you're, aren't you stretching those ligaments? And now those organs, over time, over the decades, are hanging lower and lower and lower, and it's stressing out the ducts and the veins and the arteries. You know, I can get into the weeds with this on uh, someone who does a lot of running and, and look at the other side of the coin. So in other words, one of my approaches is, can you get the benefits of, of running without any of the detriments? Can you get the benefits of garlic without any of the detriments of garlic? Um, and, and usually the answer is yes. So that's my approach, is get the benefits of something without any of the downsides. And if you just do a lot of you know walking and you do some brisk walking um, and you do some sprinting once a week, so when people say you don't run, I say, yeah, I run, I'm a runner. I run once a week for 10 seconds. <laughs> I like it. And then, you know what? That's going to keep my sprinting mechanism in really good shape. So when I'm 90, I'm still going to be able to sprint. It may not be for as long as I can sprint today or as fast as I can sprint today, but how many 90-year-olds do you know that can still sprint? Yeah, I totally hear your argument. 
And yet, I, I, like, I like the fact that these people are inclined to exercise at this level, and they're kind of seeing what's possible. So I, I hope it won't in the long term hurt them, uh, but I think it's pretty, it, it's impressive that they're showing up a lot of the meat eaters at the end of the finish line. Oh, sure. And, and that speaks well for, for veganism.